Hey, this is Gary Lynn from Australian Yoga Research, and you are listening to the Bigfoot Club Podcast. Hey guys, please go to our website at www.bigfootclubpodcast.com. Check out our merch and all episodes. Also, please look for our social media at Twitter, Facebook, Instagram at Bigfoot Club One. That's Bigfoot Club Number One. Also, check out Matt Knapp's Bigfoot Crossroads on YouTube. Hey everybody, Robert Jesse Dominguez, Bigfoot Club, Season 4, Episode 23. I'm here with... Me. You. Steven. <laughs> Steven Dominguez. Mm-hmm. Dominguez. Dominguez. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, uh, how's your week so far? Yeah, it's it's going good. You know, I, got, I caught something from the boys, like a little sinus cold or whatever, and, but I'm getting yeah, yeah. over it. I think I got it too, so... Yeah, um, it's just it's just nothing but like, you know, phlegm and runny nose stuff, uh, no fevers, uh, mild coughing. Good. Yeah. So you're not you're not twitching this week or nothing? No, okay. I because I, I didn't I, I had a runny nose like the days I usually twitch and I I'd hate for to twitch and then somebody joins and then they're like they hear this. Constantly, yeah. That's this, nice. yeah, and no. So um no, I'm not twitching, but I will uh, hit the ball rolling Monday. Okay. Well, good deal. Mm-hmm. Well, today we got in our midst today, Yowie Dan from Australia. Yowie. Yowie Dan, welcome to the club. Oh, it's really uh, great to be on the show and um, have a talk about my favorite subject, the Yowie. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, I, you know, I was going to say this, uh, Yowie Dan, is that uh, a couple years ago, a friend of mine sent me the uh on facebook he sent me a link to track with uh attila Caldi. and that's where i was i first saw you i saw i i watched that i watched it a couple times and i really really enjoyed i really like uh attila's view on that documentary and uh that's where i first saw you then Whenever I get to talking to Sarah, she asked, you know, she asked me about talking to you. I go, yeah, we did. They go, yeah, I would, I'd love to talk to that guy. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I was, I was a big fan. And um, I know on, on that, on that documentary, you had some amazing footage uh, in Glenbrook, right? Or Glenbrook? Yeah. Yeah. Glenbrook. <laughs> okay. So Glenbrook's um, probably the, one of the first suburbs you go to when you get up to Blue Mountains and Blue Mountains is 50, 60, 70 k's, maybe 50 k's from the west of Sydney, the city. Mm-hmm. Um, pretty much go on the uh, on the M4 freeway and it takes you straight to the Blue Mountains. So the Blue Mountains is, um, look, when the first settlers came here in uh, the 1788 and by the time they got out to near the Blue Mountains, they needed, needed more pastoral uh, land, so they needed to go over the Blue Mountains, and it took like 26 attempts to walk over it. And finally, three guys, Blacksland, Wentworth, and Lawson, and it took them 21 days to get over the other side. And then over the other side is, you know, all this great land for pastoral and cows and whatever, you know. So there's a lot of history with the Blue Mountains, and there's a lot of history with uh, it's probably the most hot spot of sightings and encounters over the years in Australia. So I, well, after I had my first encounter with a Yowie down in uh, Appen, which is about 60, 70 k south of Sydney, at a greyhound track of all places, I decided to say, well, I might as well go to Blue Mountains. There's got to be something up there. Before, I, I didn't even know that was a hot spot. So I basically just picked Glenbrook as it just being the easiest place for me to get to it takes me half an hour to get there by car. Uh, it's a short little trail. And I just happened to thought I'll set up some trail cams and I'll set up some sound recordings and I've picked a few and recorded a few great sound recordings. And I actually had a Achilles tendon operation and uh, I shouldn't have been there, but, um, you know, when you get a bit eager and people are showing their uh, what they've got uh, on, on, like, the AYR Australian Yowie Research Forum or on Facebook, you get a bit keen. And so, yeah, I was a bit sore and hiking in. took about a kilometre to get to that spot. It's not easy to get down there either. And uh, I was down there and I just found a tree break. And I just thought, it's not a big one, but I know these trees are little plants are hard to, to, to break them, to snap them. So I pretty much, as I put the camera down on a big rock there to 
bend this tree to show that I just couldn't break it myself. I picked up something in the background and it looks like it's much further away than what it is, but it's only about, oh, I'd say 15 metres away. Um, and it was standing next to a 12-foot uh, rock ledge, so and it was about a foot shorter than that. So I didn't see it or smell it or hear it, but I did see it after watching that video a few times and then discussed it with a fellow researcher, David Reed, and he says, I think you've got something here. And... Like I say to people, you can fully understand it. You, you can't fully understand it until you actually go to the actual area and stand next to that rock, that rock ledge. And if you're about six foot tall, you've got to stand on your shoulders again to reach the top. And I don't know what creature other than a yowie will be that tall. Wow, that was like – it was almost like whenever I saw it on that, on that documentary and then I saw it on your website, uh, Australian Yowie, um, I did see that um, – that thing was it was pretty pretty dang tall and it was probably watching you. That's that's what I was kind of that's the first thing I thought in my mind. It was probably watching you or just kind of checking you know checking you out, see what you were doing. Yeah, yeah, obviously it was because it, uh, in the footage you can kind of see it like if you really study it closely on a bigger screen you can see it kind of it's turning around. Mm-hmm. And I did a, I did have a cough as well, so I'm kind of coughing all the time. And I was down there for a fair while because I just didn't go down to that. Um, the creek bed and then stand there. I actually decided, I thought I'd walk down the creek a bit, but because I was getting a bit slippery in my tendon and my you know, my, my heel and wasn't quite the best, um, I decided to thought I'll just stay where I was and that's where I went back and went, oh, I, I've, I've just missed this tree break. <laughs> I better like, study this and show, and show the people like it's not easy to break them. So, and that's where I caught it. So, yeah. I was talking with Gary Lynn last week um, and he, we were talking in, in great deals about tree breaks and about symbols, and mm-hmm. uh, we were just really into it, like really, really bad. And I noticed that you, during that, that documentary and any kind of like video that I was watching of you recently, that you're kind of into that too. You kind of like observe that stuff, and you, because uh, to me, it's, it's always like it's their language, and they wanna they wanna speak to us, and if only if we're if we're listening and viewing. So what you know? What's your take on that? Yeah, I find that most of the activity is around things like tree breaks. And there's one place up in the Blue Mountains in the Jamison Valley that um, I have been researching for a number of years. At the moment, we can't get in there because of the like recent rains and bushfires. It's really dangerous with trees that are still, you know, about to fall over, so they're just not letting anyone in, which is a good thing because when I would go back there, no one's been around it. The, the yowies might come up <laughs> to us a bit closer, but I've camped there on a few times, and during the documentary track, um, we did find uh, these tree breaks, and there were people might say, ah, oh, it's just, um, uh, it could be the wind or it could be, you know, a storm come through or uh, some sort of insect doing it but these things were all broken in the same height along the ridge and in a straight line about 10 meters apart so it's a bit weird that they're all on the same level not one five meters lower one 10 meters higher kind of thing so i've found more uh, activity around them sites and i've thought well if they're doing this it's got to be for a reason is it like this is the end of our our uh, land and the other side is some other tribe's land i'm not sure it's just they, 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 and then, like up in Queensland, they're getting like sticks getting made into shapes like an A shape and sticks sticking up out of the ground like they've been shoved into the ground. I have not really seen it too much in the Blue Mountains, but it's interesting the boys are getting that stuff up in Queensland. Yeah, I think uh, yeah Gary Lynn was talking about that. I found that fascinating because um, I know like in here in Texas, uh, I, like in the 90s and early 2000s, I would find a lot of that stuff like that, like sticks stuck in the ground. Or like little little bitty teepees, like or even bigger teepees, and um, my mentor uh, Luke Rose would always he would he was thinking that it was like Bigfoots in like in the states here, they were like using like a, a parsimons branch or a Mexican plum branch and they were putting it together and he thought that that's what they were doing they were they were leaving like a little like a little trail on what's in the area. So I don't know if that's like that in Australia, but, you know, that's one of the theories that we had here, like in the States on stuff like that. So, Yeah, well, I haven't come across that, but I have come across something interesting. I was up, uh, you're looking about two, two and a half hours north um, in the Hunter region um, of New South Wales, and we found a small teepee 
like structure, which was probably three foot high. But then not far from that, we found uh, a grass plant that had been braided, like, you know, braided girl's hair. Mm-hmm. And, it had been, yeah, and, and it was in a really remote spot. And I'm thinking, why would a person just do that and then sit down and braid this plant? And it was plenty of grass plants like that around, but only one was braided. And I've got photos of it. It was really weird. So there was a flooding there not too long before that, but none of the other plants were like that. If it was because of the water, they'd all be like that, not just one plant. So, yeah, you do come across some weird things sometimes. Um, I, w- I was going to say this because I know I've listened to your show with uh, Sarah Bignall recently. I think it was like yeah. um, a month ago, I think. It was a couple yeah. weeks ago. And, yeah. I, you know, whenever I'm in the woods, because I go to Oklahoma, Arkansas, East Texas, but every time I'm in the woods, I don't always find Bigfoot stuff. I always, like, run across, like, some weird, weird that I don't I've never seen before, like lights or uh, I know if I put out like uh, game trackers out and I've we've caught like uh, full body aberrations of like a torso walking by and just stuff like that. Have you had have you run into any paranormal stuff like that? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, while we were recording for track. Uh, yeah, plenty of stuff's happened from like uh, what we call a min min light. It's like a big as a basketball blown not basketball um a beach ball you know you got beach balls you blow them up and hit them around um one of them big one like that um come out of the bush um we've had uh, i've had something yell watch out to me while we were hiking out um at about two o'clock in the morning we've seen ufos flying around um i've seen a ghost flying along the trail yeah we've seen yeah and even this we've seen this little black figure it looked like a little miniature slender man kind of figure and it, it wasn't even showing up as like a heat signature on the thermal. It was still stayed black when it should have come up as like a bright white. Um, yeah, so we've had our plenty of things happen and you just can't explain it. But I know that area where we did see the ghost and I had uh, something say watch out to me, it was a, a mining area for um, kerosene in the late 1800s and um, there wouldn't have been any occupation, <coughs> sorry, occupational health and safety then. So I think, a number of people may have, may have lost their lives down there, so that's why there's activity there. So, yeah, that's uh, certainly you don't expect these things, but when it happens, you know, that, that freaks me out more than seeing a Yowie. I'd want to see a Yowie every day of the week, but when this paranormal stuff happens, it's um, it's generally, you know, gets you on your toes. It, it does. I uh, so, can, Go ahead. So, go ahead. No, I was going to say, so, Dan, next time you go looking for a Yowie, just pretend you're going to look for ghosts. <laughs> and the yaoi will show itself like oh you know you know and, and i think that's i mean that that's always a joke on that like if we're if yeah we're in the woods we're like oh we're like so excited to look for bigfoot i think the bigfoot like read feels that or gets some type of reading on, on that and they're like nah i think they like they like surprising people i think that's what it yeah. is yeah yeah, yeah, but you, it's yeah because you, what what freaks you out a bit more, gets you a bit on on, on nerve, is you you're, you're concentrating like there was one time down there's a place called Belangolo and it's really infamous because it was the backpacker murder site when this guy Ivan Malat was picking up backpackers and he was murdering them and burying them in that Ooh. bushland. Wow. So yeah, so um, anyway, so he I think he got over ten people, you know, from people from Germany, England, around the world. Anyway, they eventually got him and um. So we found actually one of the sites and because it had a, the, one of the girls' names on it and a German flag. And while we were research, researching near there, uh, um, there was nothing of this was on track. It's just, you know, we were right. just down there. So, yeah, so yeah, while I had the thermal and I was had it trained on Attila and Duo, uh, yeah, something just went <sighs> and breathed over my shoulder. And this place is pitch black. You, you put your hand in front of your face, you can't see anything. It's so dark and freaky so yeah when you re- you, you, you're concentrating on about yaoi stuff and then something breathes over your shoulder that's when you start looking around going who's standing behind me so yeah <laughs> yeah that's uh well that's that is creepy especially if you yeah. can't see because i know i've i've talked about this on my podcast talked about it with i think uh, gary lynn and some other people i think john john kershaw as well um yeah some people have asked me because I, I i do i've done bigfoot stuff for like 20 years and i was a case director for a paranormal group for 10 and a lot of times whenever I was interviewing people from the paranormal side, they were talking about EMF and, you know, how people respond to EMF. And, and you know, some pe- when, when you're bombarded by it, you some people react differently. 
they get you know nauseated, lightheaded, they see stuff. And then I was talking to someone else in Bigfoot stuff, and we were talking about EMF, and they say, "Hey, that kind of sounds like infrasound." <laughs> so, um, mm-hmm. I wanted to know your take on EMF and infrasound. Do you think it's the same thing, or do you think it's separate? Um, because like Bigfoots, because I I know I've been in some areas that. Like you're saying, I, I went to an area in Oklahoma called Brown Springs, and uh, the Dallas mob used to dump bodies there, and there was a lot of Bigfoot activity there. And so I took mm-hmm. an EMF reader with me, you know, just to test it out. And in that area, sometimes, because there's no power lines out there, there's nothing, and I would get some reads out there. So I just wanted to know your take on that. Um, I really haven't had anything to do with EMF readers. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, you know, I haven't really researched paranormal, even though there's a lot of weird things happen to me in my life of paranormal, but I think everyone's got a fair share of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, the, the infrasound, yeah, the, the, that comes up, uh, a few times. I'm not really sure because I don't know like any kind of apes or any kind of uh, animal that would be related to a Yowie has that ability. So mm-hmm. I'm not quite sure if this is something that's just been brought up and, people will just go, yeah, yeah, because someone says it. Right. It's actually a thing. Pro- but pro- Projection, but, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I, I do know, like, it's your own personal, like, anxiety has a level to give you that kind of feeling as well. Because um, even when I've been out and a bit of, you know, you get a bit anxious. And I've been out, like, by myself into places where it's taken me five hours to hike, and I'm the only person there. I'm in the middle of the bush, especially when I was first going out. Um and I just said to myself, oh, you know, what's what else? we don't have bears and cougars and all this kind of stuff. And we just have poisonous things like spiders and snakes. So as long as we stay away from them, uh, you're usually pretty good. So, But you still get a bit anxious. And I think that's when that kind of feeling comes over you. You do feel like, you know, what they've saying, what infrasound does to a body. So I think it's your own personal uh, feelings that does make you feel a bit weird. Like when you get anxious, you kind of start feeling nauseous and, you know, mm-hmm. lightheaded and stuff like that. So I think that that could be something that um, that contributes to, you know, you feeling that way and thinking it, it's something else when really it could just be a normal animal that you know in the bush running around. Because I know, look, I've been out in the bush and even like a small rat going around through the leaves sounds like something 10 yeah. times heavier than what yeah. it is. It sounds like a train. You know, <laughs> yeah, because it's so quiet out there. You only hear like an owl, like a clomber away or something, and then you these rats going around, you're like, what the hell's that? So that can freak you out as well because you don't know, you can't see it, but it sounds like it's a big animal. So Yeah, because I think uh, one of the very first times I went out in the, in the woods in East Texas, it was six or, six or seven of us, and we were camped out on this power line, this power line right away. And we heard something like trampling through the woods and everybody pulls their weapons out. I didn't have a weapon, but everybody pulls their weapons out and put like their spotlights. And it was an armadillo. And it was like, uh. <laughs> so it was like, <laughs> I go, come on, man, seriously. But, uh, but it's just, yeah, stuff like that. They, they make it sound like it's a, it's a train, but it really is, you know, it's just a little yeah. bitty animal. So talking about power lines, when we were filming for track, it sounded like, um, cause this power lines going not far from where we were goes from one side of the ridge to the other right across that uh, that creek there and it sounded like a, a didgeridoo it was you know that didgeridoo noise and we end up working out it was the power lines so um yeah so they do give off some weird noises as well you gotta you gotta be aware of that yeah uh, i know in east texas that's one of the very first places i look i don't know if i've ever talked about that with anybody else but uh, in East Texas, there's like there's a lot of there's a lot of woods and there's like electrical right of ways that go through counties, and mm. and I find a lot like tree breaks, footprints, um, scat, uh, just stuff like that going through because that that's almost like a sidewalk for them. They can just walk straight through that you know un, uncumbered with woods and stuff like that. So that's one of the first pr- places I look. I never thought about that in Australia. If you, if you guys have that or like a a gas right of way that cuts through an area or a state or something? Yeah, or they, we do have them. They're more out um, in areas not close to houses because they do um, damage, you know, they give you cancer and stuff Mm -hmm. from the power. But um, in the Blue Mountains is like those big power lines going through even one of the valleys when you go to the end of, um, to Naranek, which is, reaches past, it's going, it's in between, um, well, pretty much where the Free Sisters is. If you look to your right at Katoomba, there's Naranek, and you can go, it takes about two hours to walk to the end. 
when you get to the end of that, you can see power lines coming in and there's like there's pretty much no trails in there because it's the water catchment area for for Sydney. So, um, but you can see where they've, there's no trees there. So that's where the power lines are. And there's also, I find um, there's been sightings here where the water comes from those areas to the treatment plants and stuff like that. So the big um, the big water, um, what do you call them, the, um, the water lines, and they do have seen sightings along them. So it's like you're saying, they, go, they can easily go from one place to another, just walking along them and then go back into the bush. Right. So that's, that's an area where I've been thinking of going to research and set up some cameras and see what I get. I was noticing on Sarah's show, that you had a sighting of a, uh, hopefully I'm saying it right, Jinjare? Uh, I would say Junjiri. Some people say um, it's pretty much, yeah, I say Junjiri. So um, it's a small uh, like type of Yowie, which only gets to about three foot, three and a half foot tall. And that's after I had my encounter, which I didn't see the one that happened, but it just pretty much, nearly pulled a 20, 20 uh, I think it was about, it wasn't 20 metres, about 20 foot tall tree out of the ground um, and scared the life out of me and my greyhound. Uh, I want to go, I wanted to see one. So this was at Glenbrook and it wasn't far from where I actually filmed the big one and it paralleled me along the trail for about 800 metres. And when I got to an area where there was paperbark trees and it's a bit more open, um, it actually got there first before me and it's raining and it's foggy and then I just seen it pretty much about three foot off the ground. I only really saw its head and a bit of its shoulder and it was either jet black or it was like a dark chocolate. But when the water hits hair, it makes it darker than what it is and it just kind of blinked at me and, and then it just kind of moved its head and then I, after it did that, I started picking out all the features of it. You know, it was only, it, it looked like it was an adult but of of its size, you know, it wasn't a, 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 a like a juvenile, but um, yeah, that, that's when all the hair stood up on the back of my neck, and I went, "Gee, these things are real." Now I know they're real, so then I started, you know, pushing forward with doing research. Yeah, so not only did I have an encounter, but that actual sighting really made me hundred percent sure that they were there. I wasn't sitting on the fence still. Um, is that because I don't I don't know? I'm asking this question. Uh, is that a part of ab- Aboriginal lore? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, um, they're like the cheeky ones that, you know, will come in and, you know, people have said they've been, you know, camping in like, uh, like they've been camping with like school and they've, or they're out there with their family and they, they're in the bush and no one locks the doors or anything and they come in and they touch them and grab them and, you know, stuff like that or they'll try to pinch your stuff. But I'll say one thing, we were in the uh, Jamison Valley and... It was Attila and Duo and myself, and we'd walked off the trail and gone into the Jamison Valley, and I had a parabolic dish and my thermal monocular, and I'd been looking down into the into the valley there for you know, probably half an hour, and we'd hear a bit of a noise. I've turned around because Duo said, there's something up, I can hear something moving up the top. And there is possums there, but there's not a great deal of them. Um, so I'm looking around, and I got that feeling that something was behind me, and then it actually trod on a twig or something and it cracked and it was pretty much within a metre. And I'm thinking, this thing's come up to try and steal my parabolic disc. So I've turned around, kind of got the shock of my life, and then it just took off down in the ridge. And then I've kind of tried to find it, but there was too many big, massive boulders that have fallen down off the top of the cliffs over, you know, eons and fallen down and big trees that have fallen and you just couldn't see anything. But, yeah, it was something come right up behind me so they do they, they, they've been known to be the cheeky ones and will uh you know try to steal your stuff you think you think they work and they work along with yowies as as a distraction no i think they're just a separate type of creature altogether and um i've never heard anyone saying that they've seen a big one and small one together other than saying the small one was actually a juvenile yowie so i've never heard of that okay hmm um, I was going to say that I've got a lot of people on Facebook ask me about thongs with you. <laughs> so I, I was looking because I know uh, Gary Lynn, uh, uh, John, John Kershaw, sure. uh, yeah. Roger, I'm going to probably butcher his name, Roger uh, De, De Gata, De Gatari? De- 
take a toddy. Yeah. yeah. yeah, they, were, yeah right, right. they were asking me everything about thongs, about, you know, what yeah. size you <laughs> So, you know, because, like, people here, like, in the States, thongs mean, like, underwear, right? But it's yeah, not, it's not the same thing. Thongs are G-strings. Thongs is what we call your flip-flops, I believe. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think flip-flops is pretty a, a weird name. Thongs sound better. But anyway, yeah, yeah, like I always say, it in, oh, I just find it more comfortable to hike in. <laughs> wow. No, look, 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 look this, is, this is the reason behind it, all right? There's oh. some, there were some, some people that were a bit dodgy, all right, and they, they have their video, and they're saying they're way out in the bush, middle of nowhere, and they're wearing thongs, okay? <laughs> and next minute you hear a, mate, a road motorbike go past, you know, like a Honda or a Kawasaki, and I'm like, well, you just told me you're in the middle of the bush. And um, and you're middle of nowhere, there's no one here, and a, and a, and a road bike just goes by. You, people don't ride road bikes down bloody bush trails. <laughs> so, so I just thought, I just put, take a bit of a, what we call taking the piss, which is like making fun of them, and I'm yeah. just going to say, you know, hiking thongs. So, but I do. I have done it before, and I'd always take a pair of thongs with me when I go camping because you just can't wear boots all the time. Your, your feet just get sore. Yeah. And I just find walking around. Even though, look, I've been down in the bush, and we've got pretty nasty big bull ants, and you get bitten. It's like getting bitten by ten bees at once. But I had my thongs on, and this bull ant bit me about four times on the foot and my toes, and everyone's laughing at me because I'm wearing thongs and I'm getting bitten by these big bull ants. So, um, yeah. And I always say at the end of my uh, my videos on my YouTube channel, Australian Yowie, always hiking thongs. So. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> so I thought I thought that was so funny because like I, I'll get like some people like an other guest that ask me questions and I, mean, I was telling Stephen I go I'm getting a bunch of thong questions I don't know I don't know what's going <laughs> I, on I didn't know that that's what you're I go excuse me like I was like why are they asking about thongs <laughs> <laughs> and and they're like no that's what they call them. Uh, for oh. Flip flops. Like, oh, okay. All that's right. what that's what John John Kershaw had to he had to explain that to us because like I actually yeah. I actually I actually messaged John like every we almost like chat every other day so uh, yeah. But he was asking but, he asked me the question for you he asked let me see if I could find it. Look, but we he, we you got you got to realize this. John walks around in thongs, shorts, and a singlet. Like you know, like at least I I'll, I'll wear like long pants and a shirt. You know, like. <laughs> He wears even less than what I do, so he can't talk. Because <laughs> <laughs> he was he was asking, he goes, "What's the pros and cons of yowie hunting and hiking in thongs, and can they be used for self defense in the bush?" That's oh what, yeah, yeah. That, that was his yeah. question. <laughs> so so I, I had a laugh when you were talking about there was an armadillo and everyone got their guns out. Yeah. Like, you know, you guys are so different to us. Like, I've been out once and I took a machete and it was not even sharp; it was blunt. And that's when I had a rock thrown at uh, my tent in the middle of nowhere. And um, the other person that was in another tent wouldn't get out. He was too scared. So I got out, but I didn't even, I didn't take the knife with me. I just left it in the bag. It was just in case something <laughs> happened. But I've never taken a weapon even before that or after it. it was, that's my last, my last thought. So we're very different in way when things happen, um, maybe because we haven't got bears and all those other animals that can eat you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's a bit different down there's, here. We just got we just got animals that can bite you, and in twenty minutes you're dead. So it's, I don't know. It's the same thing. Yeah, there was there was a time I was in I was in East Texas, and I was I was walking adjacent along someone's property, and uh, I think the the property I was walking on was uh, on a creek bed, and it was like lower than the property that was right adjacent to us, and they had yeah. like a, a barbed wire fence, and some of it was overgrown, and I was walking down this trail. I was I, I was uh, taking point on it. And one of my research buddies was young, and he goes, Dominguez. And I turn around, and it was like this hog from the other side of the fence was charging me. And, and it looked about 300 pounds. And, and it didn't see the fence. It ran right into the fence. Boom. And it was like, it sounded like a big explosion. And I just took off running. And I go, okay, I've gone. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, there's, like you were saying, there's, there's not supposed to be any bears and panthers in Texas, but I've seen... I've seen prints of like bears and I've seen prints of panthers and uh and there's like mm. huge hogs out there so but yeah man I I don't I don't personally care I don't carry again I I think I used to take a knife and that was that was about it but uh mm. but I just I kind of just I kind of just leave it up to faith I said you know what I'm going to be okay so it's better to yeah, say, well, better safe than sorry though yeah I'll, yeah I'll tell you a story about um about um uh my recording from Glenbrook uh, the actual 
a friend of mine, he used to be in the, um, uh, not the firefighting, it was like the the volunteers, and they help when there's bushfires. And they're always um, practicing and that. But being in doing that, he got to know a few of the national parks, people that are up in the Blue Mountains. So he was at the other a place called Nunes, which is on the other side of the Blue Mountains, um, towards getting towards um, Lithgow. And he took, he said to me, do you mind if I show him your Bigfoot um, or Yowie video footage to someone? I said, yeah, I don't really care. So he um, showed it to these. Um, there was three uh, national parks rangers, and they said, ah, they looked all looked at each other and said, someone's finally filmed it. And he's going, filmed what? And he wanted to get the actual, you know, the 100% that they say that they're there. And they said, oh, yeah, it's a, it's a Yowie. And he's like, oh, so you guys know about him? And they go, yeah, yeah, of course. But we don't really say anything about it. And one of the girls, um, what was a ranger, she said she was up on a ridge at the at Glenbrook and she had binoculars because she just wanted to see that the third-party contractors were actually doing their job properly because um, they get a lot of third-party go- builders to make the, the stairways and change logs and stuff on trails when they're rotted. Anyway, so she was just panning around and she looked into the valley and she thought she saw a massive pig, like a huge pig because it was on all fours and it was hairy. And she said then it stood up on two legs and walked away like it was in a clearing and then it walked into the bush. So she said, yeah, I've seen one too. Wow. You know, mm. it's it's it, like I was just going to say, I get the exact opposite here like in uh, in the States because I know mm. I've, I've been in some areas that we know that have, have Bigfoot and we would, yeah. we would travel down this dirt road and they would they would put like these um, these markers. I guess it would it would signal whenever a vehicle would, like passes by. Mm. As soon as, as soon as we would park and get our gear out, uh, like a, a game warden would show up and he would like just hang out with us. And he goes, "Hey, what are you doing?" And we, we you know at first I used to say you know Hey, I'm I'm a Bigfoot researcher." And they would just hang out with us until we left. And yeah. so after a while, after a while I got really smart because I was I was going to school. And I had a, had a had a student ID and I told him I was doing a paper on deer migration and i was uh and i was doing that then they, they just left me Stop. alone after that so but here man they they hang out with you until you go they they, they don't Why? they don't want to talk about, they just don't want to talk about it they you know they just I, I i to me i i think it's logging you know and if and if there's a, a bigfoot's like discovered there then they, they gotta they have to protect it they can't log in that area so i i don't know it's, that's weird yeah we, look I've only had the, the, the rangers that are the indigenous rangers. So they, if you say to them about the Yowies, they'll, they'll, they'll open up and talk to you about it. Mm. Especially we, we met one up at, um, there's a place called um, uh, Barrington. They say it's called Barrington Tops. And it's been known there that there's a lot of them around there. And if you, the new documentary Tracking the Law uh, from Attila Caldi, mm-hmm. that I'm in there as well. And um, we, actually went up there and we got footage of one and it was by um, a lady named Katie Austin. So um, if you, when you see Tracking the Law, you'll see footage of a Yowie uh, that was probably a couple of metres from us at the time. It wasn't wow. that far away. Yeah, yeah. And, it was, and, it, and people would say, I've had some people say, oh, it's a big snake. And I said, well, I don't know any snakes that go around in minus seven conditions. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, yeah, so... So uh, look out for that one when you see Tracking the Law. And uh, there's a couple other things that are in there really interesting as well. But uh, I will say one thing that I thought Track Search for Australia's Bigfoot was really good. Like, it is really good. I'm not saying it's not, but no, Tracking it is. the Law. It is good. Tracking the Law is on a next level. It's on a next level. And you'll watch it and you'll go, I'm going to watch uh, Straight away when it, I've seen it, because pretty much everyone that was in it, Attila's let um, watch it first. Mm-hmm. And I've watched it. 10 times and i'll probably watch it again this afternoon so mm, it's we, it's it's the next level it's we're, really good we're, we're interviewing him next week so i'm pretty excited oh okay yeah no Attila's a, a really interesting person to speak to he's a smart man and he knows how to make a good uh a documentary so it keeps people interested and then every, everyone that's seen track that is not even interested in yeah he's going that was really good like, like i want to watch it again so yeah, it it is really good, and I I saw it way back then, and you know getting ready for you know talking to you, I, I've been watching it this week, and uh, I'm pretty excited because I you know we're on a pretty good 
Australian run because we you know I've already in, we've already interviewed Sarah Bicknell, mm-hmm. uh, John Kershaw, Gary Lynn, Gary Lynn. Uh, you today, and then Attila yep. next week. So I'm on I'm on a pretty good run. So <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, I've noticed too um, is that Australia is like a hot spot for not only Yowies obviously but UFOs. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Is there like any like you said you saw some UFOs and and. Yeah, um, in the Blue Mountains, like when we've hiked out during the making of track, uh, 2019, um, we were, you know, sometimes things weren't just happening or we were just planning on not camping, just staying there till like really early in the morning mm. and hike out at three o'clock in the morning and stuff like that, go back. And it's like a two and a half hour, three hour hike out because you've got to go up the mountainside and it's a trail, but it's about, takes about an hour, hour and a bit to go up the tr- up that trail because you got your backpack with all your gear so you're not doing it with just your own body weight you've got to carry all your gear as well and um yeah so well when we got about three quarters of the way up the top there and the boys were about another 20 meters behind me and i just took my backpack off and this is i don't know probably three o'clock in the morning and i can see these big white lights flying around and you could see how they were going down into the bush and you could see them flickering because they're going through all the trees and then coming back up and doing all these weird you know movements and i'm like well they're not drones uh there's no there's just bush down there there's no who would be there's no planes could do that, or even helicopters. And I'm thinking, what's that? And Attila goes, yeah, that's the UFO base down there. I go, what? He goes, yeah, there's supposed to be a UFO base down there. And I think we've walked out three or four times around the same kind of time in the morning, and they've always been there. So it could be some truth to it. Yeah, he's he's on, like, a couple of UFO documentaries, is he, is he not? Yeah, look, I first met Attila when he ran the, um, a, a UFO group down in Campbelltown, just south of Sydney, and I used to go there back in around 2000, 2001. And when I was training greyhounds and then my twin boys come along, it was just too much, so I had to leave, which I didn't want to do. I couldn't go to the meetings no more. And it wasn't until he he messaged me in 2018 about doing the documentary track that we we got back together. And, um, yeah, so, yeah, he's been into the UFO. And, look, he knows everything about him. Um, He knows more than a lot of people you know, in Australia, and, you know, any time I've asked him about anything, he comes up with a story, and I'm like, I didn't know that. So, yeah, so there's supposed supposed to be one. He told me there was supposed to be a UFO that crashed down just not far from Appen, a bit further down south, and a truck driver actually saw it and come over in flames and crash, um, and then um, Attila actually spoke to the guy. So, yeah, it's, it's, there's some UFO activity um, happening. We went out. Oh, it was Attila, uh, David Reed, and myself. We just went out uh, one night um, up to around Wentworth Falls area, and we actually seen a big bright light go from like a cigar shape back to a big circle, back to a cigar shape, and it looked massive. Um, and it was all bright, like a bright white color, and then it just disappeared. So yeah, there's a lot of uh, sightings of UFOs over the years in the Blue Mountains. Wow. So is it like, I guess the Blue Mountains is, is just a, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say a portal, but like a beacon? Is there is, is there a landline there? Landline? Like yeah. a, there, there's, there's a lot of houses and everything that's well built. Like there's a lot of people that live up there. So um, I don't know about portal or anything. It's just that it's like a lot of places, you can say the vast majority of the Blue Mountains has never had a human walk through it. It's just... You can't get in there. It's just too hard. Unless you're getting dropped by a helicopter or something, you just can't get there. It looks it looks rough. I mean, I don't. It yeah. is. It's something it is, that, that, that Look, I would not hike through and be yeah. like, oh, you know. I, I did a hike from uh, Canangra Walls, which is about fifty or sixty k's west of Katoomba, and you've got to hike from there to up Taras Ladder to Naranek and walk back um, to Katoomba, and it took us uh, four nights, five days. And um, and that is hard. That was hard. The whole thing was hard. Like you have to filter water at three different areas, and you've got to carry everything up and down mountain sides. There's one called Mount Cloudmaker because you're pretty high. It's up in the clouds, uh, and yeah, everything about that was just crazy mad. It was harder than what I thought it would be. And we actually got down to an area on the Cox's River, and I said to the boys, "It looks like a um, 
it looks like uh, Bluff Creek where they filmed Paddy and um, <laughs> ah. and that's what it looked like. And I have got a sound recording there, and you, I put a sound recorder out, and it was one of the only times I actually put something out because we were just too tired to do any research. We just packed, we got to a location, put our tents up, made something to eat, and went to bed because that's how hard it was. And um, just going up and down mountains all day. And we had blisters and everything. But I set a sound recorder maybe 200 metres from our, uh, our campsite and something comes up walking around and you can hear it walking on... It's bipedal. It's not hopping like a kangaroo. They sound... There's a big difference between kangaroos hopping and someone walking on two feet. So, mm. yeah, and I've recorded that. And that was really... was something that I thought I would never get in that area. And we actually... When we first got down there and we thought we'll go and first thing we'll do is filter some water because we're all thirsty. We nearly run out of our, our supplies. And um, we heard wood knocks everywhere. So, And it was no wind. There was no wind. So I know trees hit each other here. And when they go, they do that wood knock noise. Mm. But they were all still, even up to the top of the ridge down to the bottom. It was a really calm day. But that didn't happen until we got to the bottom. So we're like, we're like, can you hear that? Did you hear that? And we're like, they just went off for about 20 minutes and then they stopped. Wow. Uh, you mentioned Katuma. Katuma is that is that the place where they have like that giant staircase? Yeah, that's where the three sisters are. It's a it's an Aboriginal uh, Dreamtime story, and then there's the giant staircase. I've gone down it, and I think I counted nine hundred and seventy two steps. So oh, that's I think that, that was on Bluey. Oh, was it on Bluey? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Steven Steven's got two twin boys. They're five, and they watch Bluey all the time. So oh, okay, Bluey. <laughs> yeah, they they love it and. They try to, they themselves try to do their own Australian accents, and it's just like they'll be they'll be talking to me, and I'm like, what? Yeah, you know what's funny? Uh, uh, Yowie was uh, I was I was looking at your YouTube page today, and I was like looking at some of the stuff that you were doing, and you were talking through some videos and stuff, and I pulled up Australia, and I was like trying to figure out where you're at, and the boys walked up and it goes, hey, Bluey's from there. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, and I go because what are you looking at? I, I'm, I'm looking at Yowie Dan. We're gonna go. Uh, Daddy and I are gonna talk to him tonight. They go. Oh, okay. Can you ask him about Bluey? I go. Yeah. Oh, I don't think he knows Bluey, buddy. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I know about Bluey, but when my kids were young, they're 21. My twins, they were into the bear in the big blue house and Blues Clues and oh, blues yeah, blues. Blues. yeah, yeah, yeah. So Bluey, but, yeah, it's a. Uh, my, uh, I know about it, but. Uh, I never watched the show. <laughs> it's actually it's actually pretty good. I'm not even gonna lie. Like most kids shows today, I'm all like, no, I'm not gonna watch it. Yeah. Uh, like Mickey's Clubhouse. No, I love Mickey Mouse yeah. and all that. But whenever I was like a kid, uh, yeah. But Bluey's got some really really good, like some jokes for parents to get to. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Might have to watch it. Uh, yeah. So it's uh, it's it's not it's not too bad. I actually laughed at a couple episodes. I'm like, oh, that's pretty funny. Um, uh, yeah. If you if you boy if you boys want to have a laugh, there was a, actually a, a kid show called Agro's Cartoon Connection in the nineteen eighties, mm. and get on YouTube and look up Agro, and mm. yeah, and you will laugh your guts out. It's a guy underneath a table with a you know his hand in his puppet, and it's a pretty feral looking puppet, and it's yeah, it's saying a lot of adult stuff to the poor girl. That's <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, trust me, you watch it, you'll have a great laugh. Oh lord. <laughs> All right, we'll, yeah. we'll we'll take a look he, at yeah, that. Robert so. Robert has it pulled up already on YouTube. I'm, I'm, I don't I don't want to play it because it'll it'll it'll. No, it, no, none it, of this, none of this, none of this, none of this, none of this made none of this made the airing for the kids. But no. they did say some things on there that was like, yeah, you know, adults could pick up, and and it meant two things, you know. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll yeah, definitely we'll look show. at it. Um, there was a there was one email that I got from Evan. I think he's a uh, Australian. He says, "Hi guys." Being an Aussie, I would like to know if he thinks, which he means you, uh, Yowie yeah, Dan, uh, if he thinks all states in Australia should have an official research team that would work together to document all findings and keep records, like in the U.S. I don't think he knows the, the U.S. that well. So Yeah, no, <laughs> that, that, that well, does not happen. Yeah, I, I, it's, look, it's, it's a good thing to say. But a lot of people that I know, there's a lot more people out here researching that um, than they don't give anything out at all. Right. Uh, and a lot of people don't want to tell anyone else their research area. They want to keep it to themselves because they might be having a lot of action. And if they let it out, then people will go there and, 
you know, it's the more people that start trampling through an area that you think that's no one's going to be in it, it's, it, they just start losing. They take all, they take off. You don't get any more evidence no more. So yeah, it's I know every there's people in Western Australia doing it. There's people up the top of Queensland, um, all through Queensland, New South Wales, all through New South Wales. There's some in Victoria. There's really not many reports in Victoria, which is south of um, New South Wales. We call them Mexicans. So they're south mm-hmm. of the border. Right, right, uh, right. But, but, but they don't like it. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, yeah, most, most states, it's mostly the eastern states, so from Queensland and, and New South Wales where you get your reports. Yeah, um, I, I know I've yeah. seen a map, and it's like it's like there's, like, red dots, and it's all over on the east side. So Yeah, it's, uh, all, it's like New South, New South Wales is, like, the hot spot. Like, I think it's, like, yeah. 52% of, of hmm. reports – in the last 10 years from what I saw on the website or something like that. And yeah, I was just like, why is that? And then you look, you look at the map on Google. It's like nothing but woods. I'm like, Oh, the, the, of course, <laughs> duh, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so, and it's not easy. These woods aren't easy to get through because uh, a lot of it's all mountainous areas. So it's all hilly. So you've got to go up and down hills. It's not like it's flat. Plus uh, like now there's just reports of the first snakes coming out. So you've got the brown snake, it's like the second most deadliest snake, snake in the world. The first mm. one is called the Inland Taipan or Fierce Snake. That's up in Queensland. So um, that's more out in the desert, a bit more like open areas. But you get bit by a brown snake, which is pretty much, it's it's an angry snake. Like, it'll chase you. Um, I've nearly trodden on one of the babies one time when I took a, a, a friend, John. He's from England. And I said, he goes, what about the snakes? And I said, oh, there's no snakes in this area. I've never seen any. Within ten meters, and we trod on a brown snake. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and we saw a, and then we saw a carpet snake, and then there was a tiger snake that come swimming through the creek. And he's like, "I thought there was no snakes here." I said, "Well, they are. They, they're here today." <laughs> oh yeah, they just knew. It jinxed it. Yeah, jinxed it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's good. I don't mind seeing the wildlife. You know, it's uh, yeah. you go out there, and you know, even with trail cameras, like oh, look, I put trail cameras out not to try and get a yowie you're not gonna, i'm not you're not going to get a yowie on a trail camera if you do you're just the luckiest person in the world but yeah i, I put them out there to see what kind of other animals are out there for a food source and i had trail cameras out for three months and all i got was one wallaby but you can get luckier i will put it in an, another area on the north side of the blue mountains and i've got heaps of birds and i've got wallabies and i've got a wombat and you know it was really good just to get the normal creatures that that's known to science out there and just yeah. see what they're doing you know they, in their normal daily life so you know i'll, I'll say this uh yeah it was um i feel weird calling you that yeah we, uh, <laughs> we got a yaoi on the show <laughs> um, you can just call me dan that's okay. all right <laughs> Dan, uh, I was going to say this, like when I was in the, the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, uh, game game cams were really expensive back then. And yeah. we only had like, I think like three or four of them with uh, the group that I was with, uh, Texas Bigfoot Research Center. And we would put them out in the area to see if we can catch like, you know, Bigfoot or whatever, or, uh, the East Texas Bigfoot. And um, there was an area we wanted that we wanted to stretch it out. And this one guy had, uh, he had uh, one of these small um cameras that had like a you know a vhs tape in it and so we just we stuck it like in a crook of a tree and yep. so we were trying to get some action and so we came back the very next day the 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 recorder had had run out of battery so we went back and looked at it and so like in the middle of the day something walk you can hear something walk up walking up on it and this was like way in the woods where no one knew where i was at yeah and we, we could hear something walking up behind it and then throw a stick in front of it and it was like it was grunting, and it was throwing a stick in front of it to see if it would like because like the older the older game cans, whenever you threw something in front of it, it broke the beam. And it would it would it would do a picture, it would flash a picture. Yeah. And so we had thought. I said, okay, it could see these, it could see hmm. these these uh, game game cams out. So we would put them in areas that we didn't want a bigfoot, or we wanted to corral a bigfoot into an area, or if someone saw a bigfoot like behind their house, I would tell I would tell like, like a lady. I said. If you don't want to see a Bigfoot, I go go to Kroger or go to not Kroger, Kmart, and go buy like three game cams and put it behind your house. You won't see them ever again. So <laughs> that's a good idea. We used to always think that they they were avoiding them, so we would put them in an area to like keep them out of an area. That way, we could kind of maybe see them in this one area and kind of like yeah. they'll, they'll avoid that area and just go to this area. So that's what we had always thought that, and I don't hear a lot of Bigfoot researchers talk about that. So 
I just wanted to get your take on that. See what you what you thought of that. Yeah, the the, the talk is that they can see the um, infrared, the IR light, um, and I, I know when I've put mine out there, you know, foxes and sometimes you get the odd deer in areas they'll look up. But what I've found is when I was at a place called Maramara, which is um, that was on track. Um, that was that was with the audio, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the, the howling. And I've recorded more howling again recently. It sounded different, but it was still, no one was down there. And um, I put a, a sound recorder on top of the actual, um, I had a scout guard uh, trail camera. And I had it set to take a photo every 30 seconds. And so every 30 seconds, you could hear through the, on the, that, that the sound recorder recorded, it whined and take a photo. I couldn't hear that with my own ears, but maybe other animals with better hearing can hear that thing winding and taking a shot. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's not the IR. It could just be that it's the actual noise of it taking a photo. They can pick it up. That's actually pretty good. Yeah, I didn't even think of that. Mm. So (laughs) um, I was going to ask you also, are are you – are there very many audio of Yowies in Australia? Because I don't don't recall – or maybe I'm wrong – is there there are very much people who who've done audio of like uh, screams in the house? I've heard the ones I've recorded. I haven't heard anything like that, especially the first hell from Maramara, and um, that's when my wife and a, another researcher and another guy, his name's Kurt, we've become great friends since then, and we've gone back down to Maramara like that just the last few months. Uh, and it's the best time to go down there during winter. No one goes down there. It's really cold, and I'll get my best uh, my best results when it's winter time or it's just been raining. That's what I find. That's just my personal view because I've gone out when it's been hot, and it's just it's hard to get to places. You're just drinking water all the time, and you know it's just you, yeah. you just don't want to be there because of the heat. So, but I've I've heard a couple of recordings that are noises and. It's, I know when animals like you get the big uh, cockatoos here, the big black ones, they sound different to the white, white the sulfur crested cockatoo. And when their noise goes through the bush, it changes because the noise is bouncing off all the trees. Mm-hmm. And as it comes through the bush, it sounds completely different to what it originally sounded when the actual animal made that noise. People have actually said that they've got yowie howls and stuff and noises, and then you can. If you listen to it hard enough, you can hear it. It's a motorbike in the distance. So it's, uh, you know, the people are saying that these noises and these howls are being made by a yowie, but it's actually just a man-made object. Mm. You know? mm. So it, you, it's, yeah, and it, a lot of, look, there's a lot of animals. I've got a, um, a video on Australian yowie, my channel, and it's got all the noises of, um, of different animals and what noises they make. And look, there's even a, a, a bird in Queensland that sounds like a cat. Mm. Uh, a platypus can growl. A platypus, yeah, platypus can growl. It's like, you know, have you seen a platypus? Looks like a. Yeah, a duck, a duck, a, a duck, duck beaver. A duck beaver. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> duck, a duck and a beaver put together. Yeah, so the, it's really the, weird. So, the only and, venomous uh, mammal that I know of. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to touch them. They, you, even the, the handlers have these like thick gloves on. I've never seen gloves that thick other than that what a welder would wear. I think they pretty much wear welding gloves. And, yeah, those little um, hooks on the – yeah, you can be in pain for six months or something, they said. Yeah, it's crazy. Did you, did you know about that, Robert? Yeah, I did. The males have, like – I learned that from Steve Irwin. Uh, <laughs> they, have, they have those little, little like, spike hooks on the back of their feet. Yeah. And if you grab them from the back, like, if they feel started, they'll – stab you with it and you can be in pain for like months yeah but much. you know steve Irwin grabbed one yeah you know and he was like look at this you know he was look at so, this oh, beauty like, look at this beauty right here and i was just like wow <laughs> i did not know that like i would have never known yeah it's it's crazy love steve Irwin. yeah but see the, the 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 noises that um kangaroos especially uh koalas like koalas when they're in breeding season, like some of the like weirdest noises that'll freak you out if you don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, so, so animals here can make a lot of weird noises, and you really got to, um, you know, just study uh, what noises animals can make here, and then you know you got to make an educated, um, you know, not a guess, but you really got to, you know, 
you just can't say it's a yowie to every noise that you hear in the bush. I love you know? that. I love that, that you know that you say that. That's awesome. Well, you did say too, like a lot of a lot of uh, well, Bigfoot here they like to mock a certain a certain animal. Like if it's a barred owl, yeah, like they'll mock it, and then you'll like when you hear at the end of like you. You can tell when it's a barred owl, and then you can tell it's it's a bigfoot mocking it because at the very end, like they do, like a little growl, some, like a little growl at the end. Guttural, of the guttural growl. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it makes me wonder if a yowie is doing like you know if if I'm not saying like every sound is from a yowie, right? But I'm pretty sure yowies like the bigfoots here, like they they like to mock to kind of give if there's anybody near, like what was that? Like they don't want it sense that they're there. They'll hmm. mock a, a certain animal. Be like, oh, it's just a, it's just a koala, you know, yeah. and something yeah. like that. It's it's weird. Yeah, I don't know if you got that over there, Dan, but I I've been I've experienced that. Like in the woods, I've heard, I've heard like uh, roosters. I've heard like horses, and at the very end of their call, I could hear it go like that, and I go, hmm. that's weird. Yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, you're like, well, the that's... horses don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Or, or a rooster, you know, doing his his call, and then the very end, and that's like, oh, okay, that's weird. I've, I've never, I've never had that happen. I've only ever heard, heard like these like really loud howls, and you go, that's not a dog. Uh, it's not a big cat. We don't have them here. It's not another person. We've been around this area. Um, they're pretty remote. I'm like, what the hell could it be, you know? And and like some of these howls that I've recorded, they're they're a lot louder than what it sounds on the recording. Like mm, the recording, yeah. like those first set of howls that I got back in, I think it's 2017 in Maramara. Um, yeah, it was just like that loud. And even well, Kurt, he was there with a, a girlfriend at the time, and he actually got out of the tent and started like building the fire up really big because he'd been out hunting, and he says, I know pretty much most of the noises that the Australian animals make because of being out in the bush so many times doing shooting and stuff. And um, and he goes, that's something that kind of freaked us out. And, like, my wife was with us and she, as I was recording them sounds, she was actually, you can hear her just putting more and more wood on the fire and you can hear the fire and the flames getting bigger. And I'm bigger, going, bigger, yeah. be mm. quiet, be quiet, babe. I'm trying to record, you know. <laughs> like. Like when that was happening, it did, the smile on uh, the fellow researcher and myself, the smile on our faces were that big, mate. Like we were like, yes, you know, because like you said, when when you go out, it's not like you go out and you find something every single time. I might go out ten times, I might get lucky to have two yeah, times I yeah. get something something small that I think, gee, that's weird, you know. Like I went out to, to Glenbrook again, and I went over the creek. And we've gone bush bashing and we've just bashed through all this bush and we saw this kind of like a rock overhang and we thought, I'll go up there. I, I took a guy that wanted to come out with me just to see what I do. It was his first time. And so we've gone up there and, and I'm looking around just to see if there's any footprints in this sand and he's just going, look at this. And there's fingerprints in the sand underneath the rock ledge. So, uh, you know, those fingerprints could have been there for a long time. You know, it could have been someone that walked up there two or three years earlier, but that's why there's no footprints. But it could have been a little small yowie just putting its hand there. Yeah. Who knows? But it's in a weird spot, and you're like, who would come up here? Like, I know I'm up there, but I'm doing research. But who else would walk up there for any other reason? You know, you just don't – people just don't do that. You know, the people that go for hiking, along that trail, it's called Red Hands Cave. There's Aboriginal um, – cave paintings where they put their hand there and they get the ochre and they put it in their mouth and they spit it over their hand so you can see the, 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 the shape of the hand. And there's, they, they've probably been dated to about 800 years old. And the only reason they found them was, was a young kid and I think the early 1900s got lost and they went and tried to find him and they come across that cave. Wow. So, yeah, it's the only reason. And the, the bad thing about it, people get there and try to, like, you know, graffiti there and that. So they, they've got to fence it off. So you can't actually go in the cave, but you've got to look through this, like, this cage to see it. So, which is a, you know, it's just the way humans are. Not everyone's respectful of, um, you know, that kind of thing. No, unfortunately not. Um, that's what's just sad. I was just about to ask, too, if there was any caves in, in the Blue Mountain area. Plenty. There is plenty. They're not really caves. They're more like rock overhangs, and some are big, some are small, because mm-hmm. um, it's sandstone. Um, so uh, you probably the caves are, are Janolan caves, where it's more, I think, the limestone. Um, 
so that you'd, you'd probably find there's a lot of caves around that area and Janolan and Canangra where, you know, it's got that type of rock where, it, it, you know, the water hollows it out over, you know, eons and it, that creates the caves. Mm-hmm. But um, it's all sandstone in, in the Blue Mountains area and yeah, so, and you've got to watch it. It gets very dangerous because at Wentworth Falls they had some, I think it was three workers and they were trying to f- yeah, upgrade an area and the actual sandstone rock come down and it killed two of them Oof. and the other one yeah yeah that wasn't that long ago so that area has been just pretty much closed and like i've walked through there numerous times and you can't go through there anymore i think they've just closed the trail and said no nah, no more so yeah, wow. it's a dangerous yeah, it's a dangerous area i've actually i've even got recordings at blue mountains in in glenbrook where um i had my sound recorders out and i've got a few uh, good sound recordings of some you know, weird things happening at night, like something come running past that rock ledge where I filmed the big yowie, jumped three metres down into the into the creek bed, you hear a thud, and then it walked through the, the freezing cold water at night. And then around that time, 2013, um, yeah, you heard massive trees and rocks just come down and fall down into the, into the ravine. Yeah, so they could happen any time out there. So every time I'm I'm out there, I've I've got half my mind on you know the if a tree or rocks could just instantly just come down on you. Um, how how often do you, I mean I'm pretty sure this is probably a lot, but how often do people go out into the bush and they don't and you know they don't come back? Uh, well, there's just been a few lately where there's been a lot of people getting uh, lost in the bush. And there's actually, there was one guy up down in, um, uh, I think he was down where the snowy re- region is down, uh, I think it's, he was near Kosciuszko or it was Perisher, so where the snow is, um, and it's the snow season's nearly finished as it's coming to spring, but yeah, they found him, but I think he just got lost, but um, some people have been found because they've been, unfortunately someone's murdered them, but yeah, there's a lot of hikers and campers get lost, it's mainly because they're not they they don't they don't go out that often and they haven't got the right equipment and like even when i go out sometimes i'm not sure the area i'll take like a little cup compass just so i know where north south east and west is so i know the direction i come in from so all i've got to do is go out towards that direction and i'll find my way out um but yeah it's just it's experience people we we went to the k to k like i said canangra walls to katoomba we found a, 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 a korean couple they got lost in there. They thought they could hike from there to Katoomba in one day. If you do that, you have to run most of the way. Um, and people do it. Like these fitness fanatics, they do it in the 55 Ks up and down the mountains and it takes eight hours. Wow. Mm. And, they, yeah, they do it. They're crazy. I've seen them. And, and, um, and I'm struggling with a backpack, and they're running past me and go, hey, how you going? And I'm like, geez, I wouldn't be running around here. But they go in there, and they're not experienced, and they haven't got the gear, and they've got, oh, I don't know. And they, they, they just don't research what they're going to be doing and where they're going to be going before they go in there. So that's the why they get lost. Is there any uh, re- reports on Yowies being a part of like some of the people that go missing? Look, I've been told by someone that they knew a, a, pol- a police officer in the Katoomba area like a long time ago. And I'm not sure if this is true or not, but the reports was they found two bodies where the heads were ripped off the body. It wasn't cut. It was like grabbed and like you just, they said, you know how flesh just tears. Mm-hmm. It was all torn. So the head was ripped off. Two heads were ripped off these bodies and it was a couple of months apart, um, probably going back 30 years or something like that. But that never, if that uh, would never be officially brought out as something got its head ripped off. Wow. Yeah, that's, so I'm not, I'm not sure how true that is, but that's what he told me. That someone told him, and a police officer. Wow, that is uh, yeah. interesting. <laughs> yeah, because I know uh, earlier this year we did a show on uh, um, Port Lock, mm-hmm. Alaska, and I don't know, yeah. if, I don't know if you know that story. There it was about uh, a little small mining town, like in the I think it was 19, 1920s, and a lot of a lot of people from that village got killed like in the woods their bodies were torn apart and they end up um leaving that village and then it's it's still like like abandoned like to this day because mm-hmm. like oh, i've never heard about that yeah, that'd be interesting 
yeah, these these Bigfoots were like really aggressive, and they it killed a lot. It killed a lot of people, and they they actually mentioned that like in a couple, I think, of the newspapers, and uh, <clears throat> I think it was I don't know, I, f- I forgot how many people that were there, but it was quite a bit of people because uh, it was like a fish cannery, and they uh, they were they were canning fish, and so they were a thrive they were a thriving village, and I guess the Bigfoots didn't want them there, so they. Yeah, they, they, took, they, tore, they tore them apart. Took matters into their own hands, uh, <clears throat> literally. But, I um I seen a show and it was um a, a place in Canada where you gotta like fly. The only way to get there to this cabin that's on a lake, you gotta fly like like by, by the airplane that's the lands on the water. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they went there was a I think it was like a uh it wasn't a National Geographic. So it was a Monster Quest episode or something. Yes, I think I know what you're and, talking about. Yeah, yeah. 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 And they put that kind of um, like a, a bit of wood with nails at the front door, mm-hmm. and something trod on it, and it was like the shape of a of a Bigfoot. And they they tried to get the blood and do like a DNA, and some reason they couldn't get it the DNA for some reason. But yeah, um, the, the the anthropologist is it Don? Um, what's his surname? He's Idaho Idaho State University. Uh, you're talking about Jeff Meldrum. Jeff Meldrum, yeah, he's yeah. yeah, Jeff Meldrum. Um, yeah, so he was there at that one. Yeah, so do you, do you know about any more reports around that actual cabin? Like, because that's the only one I've ever heard of. No, I, I don't think that. I don't think uh, the guy's name is uh, Doug Hotek. I think he did he did that that episode. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm friends with him on Facebook. I don't think he's doing that anymore. But I think he's doing other documentaries. But uh, I don't think there was a follow up for that one, uh, but I, I could be wrong. I don't know. I mean, if, if somebody hears this and I'm wrong, please let me know and shoot yeah. me an email or something. Or just comment. imagine being just imagine being there and you've got no way to get out, and you've got Bigfoots around there throwing rocks and yeah, because they're, they're you know, they've probably never seen a human before. They probably think they're you know they're hairless monkeys and they want to <laughs> they want to get them out of that area. So it sounds like Bigfoots are judgmental. And, uh, they need to be canceled. Yeah, they're they're like Karens or something. Yeah, exactly. Um, every like almost every episode now. now uh, Dan is. I always ask a uh, kind of like a silly question. I think yeah. I, did, I I think I did it with. Um, oh my! Oh my goodness! I'm, I'm, Gary Lynn? No, not Gary Lynn. John Kershaw. No, before that. Um, I can't think who it was. Um. Where it was in Florida. Um, oh, uh, uh, Marie Dumont. Marie Dumont. Uh, I asked her, you know, because they, they have their own version, and they're, they're called sk- uh, Skunk Apes, and yeah. there's a lot of snakes there, and it always make, I always ask, I go, do you think there's a lot of reports of, of skunk apes being bit by water moccasins? And do you think, I guess, it, it's probably nothing to them. It's probably like an ant bite yeah. to them. You know, they're like the, the snake bites them, and, like, eh, and then they'll hit it, and they'll hit it on the ground or something, or they'll wrestle a crocodile, and mm-hmm. uh, it's just something like that. Or I think I've asked uh, some people like the many times that we're we don't know, but there's probably many times where a bigfoot is like wrestling or fighting a grizzly bear. Yeah, and, and okay. pay per view, yeah. and a pay per view that we're missing. <laughs> um, with this one, I wanted to ask. And this is going to be funny. Do uh, uh-huh. you think there's any? Do you think is possibility? This probably is a possibility that Yowie's uh, trip or Bigfoot. You think they they go into like an area, trip over, a trip over something, yeah. and they fall down, and it's like a tree falling down because of how heavy they are, <laughs> um, and they get mad, like they like you know. I've like, never heard you ask that question uh, before. <laughs> And I wanted to ask that. I was like, uh, Yowie Dan, do you think it's possible? Oh, and you, 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 you said that this place is hard to get through the blue mountain. It's, it's hard. It's, you think it's hard on them. You think that when they're running or if they need to run or if they're walking in a certain area that they have not, <laughs> they've not passed, they slip or trip. You think that is possible? Um, it could be. I, 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 I could it might, look, Maybe they should wear a pair of thongs because they probably yes, stub in the yes, coat. Yes. That's the answer I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> we set that one up good. Yes, uh, yes I, know, yeah. I know. Well, Look, that could happen because I know when like something happens to me too. Like I get hit shit and I pick a rock up and go, "Yeah, you bloody idiot!" You yeah. know, and you're hobbling around. Yeah, it could happen. It's you know, it could be. Well, you know what? It could be as they could have their own area, 
and they could get the shits when another one kind of comes in and they can smell it, and that's why they get angry and they might do that to try and say the other one get out of my area. Yeah, that, mm-hmm. that, that could be something. That could be something they can get them off. But no, I don't think that if you grew up in the bush um, and you're big and strong and you can take like three meter strides, I don't think you're going to be tripping over too much. Okay, so, so uh, I mean, that's the thing. Like, if they were to trip over something, it's got to be stronger than them. Yeah, like yeah. it literally yeah. has like to be like the edge of the blue mountain. The edge of the blue mountain, <laughs> <laughs> or yeah. some type of boulder or something. Um, but no, I was that was literally my my plan. There was just have you say something about the wind. <laughs> 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 pretty you, good. You, but, yeah, I was thinking that they got to be if they're wearing thongs, they wouldn't stop. There. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they would. They would not. So. Well, look, one thing that I always thought um, is on my mind is are they because they're out in the in the bush and we've got the funnel web spider and in the Blue Mountains there's a the Sydney funnel web and the Blue Mountains funnel web and it's pretty much most poisonous spider in the world. Mm. Um, are they because are they kind of immune to these kind of um, creatures like the you know brown snakes because we get brown snakes there, tiger snakes, red belly black snakes. They're all poisonous to a certain degree. And we've got the, the the spider. So I always think uh, they've got the kind of a, a natural immunity to these kind of toxins over a period of time. Like some animals do that. Like I think is it um, is it the what's the animal that I think you guys guys got in America? And it can uh, attack snakes. Um, a small. It's like a, a weasel, or is it like a weasel honey, or some? Yeah, yeah, badger? like they the honey badger. Yeah, yeah, they just they get bitten and it doesn't kill them. So they must have some sort of it doesn't affect them. You know, so. Yeah, I was always thinking that, or I was always, they know the area so well. Obviously, they know the area. They probably know which plant to go to to, to eat or to rub, rub on the bite or something that, that cures it that we don't even know about. And, it's, possible. it's possible. I mean, it's, it's, it has to be because, I, you know, I like to you know, say not, not everybody's perfect. I would like to think Bigfoot thinks the same way. We're not all perfect. Yeah. You know, we, yeah. we can die. Uh, mm. there's, there's no limits on that, but yeah, of course they're bigger. They have a, a, a strong, like a different diet. You know, they don't have, they don't eat processed foods or all that stuff. They eat actual like stuff that's, you know, good. I wouldn't say good, like delicious, but they, they probably like it's delicious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, you know, <laughs> well, they, they just in, know the area. Yeah. It, well, in the blue mountains, they've had occasions where they've, you know, the, the yowies have gone through the bins where people have seen them in, you know, at night when, the, when it's been night to get, to get empty the next day and um yeah they've gone through the bins so um that's happened so that's why they it's sometimes it's easy just the people that live there they just hang in, in their backyard with their thermals and they look down into the valleys and they see them coming up but, but there's i don't know if you've ever heard of a, a goon bag no a goon bag no a goon bag you know like a wine cask and got that silver kind of bladder in the middle so you get your wine it's like a little casket like a little square cardboard container and then you flip this little lid and then uh, the wine comes out but we call them goon bags okay but some, someone told me that they were at a party at hazelbrook that's uh in the blue mountains and there's been a lot of um sightings there over the years and what they, he said that, that one of the guys there said that yeah we we get them and we tie the goon bags into the trees and he said the yowies come up and grab them and run around the next minute they, they squeeze them and they blow up <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! Wow! Yeah, <laughs> that, now, that's awesome. Now it just makes me wonder. Now for the next question, do, do Bigfoots get drunk? I know. Like, <laughs> it, is it something? Is there a certain plant that they get that gets them high? Wow! It's I, I like to. I think it all started with the grizzly bear thing. Yeah, and I was all like, and then and then there are moments when I'm doing laundry. Or I'm feeding the boys, and I'm like, and I just come across a, a stupid moment. Like, do Bigfoot's trip? Yeah, I have always wanted to know that. Like, do they get drunk? Do they get drunk? <laughs> now, now, like on this episode, do they get drunk? Do they get high? I don't think we've ever asked that question. No, <laughs> before no. to anybody. So, <laughs> like, do do Bigfoots have allergies? Are they allergic to like it's just yeah something like that? I don't know. I'm well, weird like that. I know one thing. You, like I've always thought I'd go out and maybe see some kind of blood or something in in, in an area where like on a rock or something, but. Look, um, you walk with no shoes on for a period of time. Your feet are going to be rock hard where you're not going to cut them. The skin's going to be that thick. Yeah. So, yeah, so they, 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 they could walk on something sharp and not even feel it, you know. So um, that's why. I, but I've been down to an area uh, 
called it's, it's called Vera Falls. It's a waterfall, but it takes about two hours to hike down from. Um, it's called uh, the Valley of the Waters. It's basically as you go down, there's all different waterfalls on the same stream. You get down to the bottom. It's called Vera Falls. One way in, one way out, uh, and pretty much all that water meets up uh, where the Wentworth Falls waterfall is, and that goes to Lake Burragarang, which is the water catchment for Sydney. So I was there one day, and I was with someone, and she wasn't uh, a believer. And I was making coffee. I was just sitting on the water, you know, just taking in all the views. And then all of a sudden, two river pebbles just go clack, clack. And it's really, like, quiet. Is only that you hear the water. And then she's just looked at me and went, what was that? I said, what do you think it was? Because... I don't know anything else that's got a thumb that can grab two rocks and clack, clack. And she just went, oh, let's get out of here. I said, so you're not on the fence no more. You're on the believer side. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. That's, that's one way to make someone believe. She, she should have stayed. Yeah. yeah I wanted to because I'm like, come on, they're here. That's why I because I was setting gear up and yeah. went off away for 10 minutes going up this little ridge. So I thought, oh, I'll put on this tree. And you, Dan, dude, where are you? I'm like, I'm up here. <laughs> don't worry. I'm all good. But, uh, yeah, we've had I've had plenty of times where I've had to get out of places because um, mainly because like uh, things is bullets, you know. Or I wanted to find another area in, in, in Springwood, which is not it's in about the middle of the Blue Mountains, and I've had some things happen there. But I want to get off the trail. I want to always want to go away from where it could be anything away from people. You know, no one's going to rock up and start setting a tent up where I am and go, oh, man, how can I research here? I've planned this and I've got all these people turn up. And so we've gone to an area, John and myself, and we're walking around. I thought, this will be a perfect area. It's got water nearby. It's not noisy. For a, You know, you get a sound recorder and there's water trickling. It just kills the sound recorder because, yeah. because I've got a parabolic dish and it's really like a high-powered one. So I can hear people talking a few hundred metres away. And if a little trickle's there, it just kills the noise that you're trying to record so anyway we go there next minute we're looking down and there's all these massive bull ants that are you know as long as your pinky finger and they've got these massive big yellow uh, pincers on them and they're trying to grab us and we were pretty much like not running but we we're moving really quick and they were keeping up with us and we're like we had to take our shoes off and go through the creek to get away from them wow they just yeah so just bull ants so you got to watch out in in the bush in australia like as soon as it gets dark sits of these Spiders that come out, they're as big as your hand mm-hmm. and massive. So, yeah, there's all different creatures that you got to watch out for that yeah. my mind's looking out for other than Yowie's <laughs> before I set up my campsites. What do you, what do you think about John Kershaw's um, sighting of that, of that dog, man? Well, yeah, he was talking about it on the AYR, Australian Yowie Research um, Forum that Dean Harrison runs. And he messaged me a few times and we we're planning on going out there. And then eventually we, we did. And then um, this, this story is going to be in Tracking the Law, the upcoming, uh, upcoming documentary from nice. Killer County. Okay. And so, yeah, so we actually went there and we had to get in um, these canoes and canoe up the river. And we finally found a place to get out of the canoes and, we got to where it was, and look, I've I stood around that area. There's no, um, it can't be like, what can I say? A, a tree stump. There's no trees there that are like, oh mate, this. It, oh, we're looking up where it was. It'd have to be close to is t- probably taller than the the the, the yowie I filmed at Glenbrook, which was that was ten wow. foot. It'd probably be eleven or twelve or something. Or it was some. I don't, it, there was nothing for it to be clinging onto something to have its head there like holding onto a tree there was nothing that a a, a substantial animal would these bushes didn't have big enough limbs to stand on or cling to so we're just just going what the hell was this um and even when you the boys have got the picture and they've kind of like i think they made it so they reversed one side Mm, and put it together and you could see the face of like this dog kind of face and i'm thinking what study dog's going to be out there? And we actually found like a, I found a few interesting things there. So you got to see the documentary. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't want to give up, give up, you know, too much on that. So that's, yeah, yeah, I don't want to spoil that. So, yeah. but I just wanted because, because I, I, you know, you, you know John Kershaw, so I, that I, yeah, I, yeah, I love yeah. that too. So that's awesome. So, yeah, hey, you got to ask John about his photo. He's got a photo, and he's got his beard, and he looks like the Hulk Hogan. 
<laughs> but, oh, wow. I don't, not, with, not by body size, just by face. Okay, I'll, I'll ask him because he was just messaging me like right before I got on with you, and he was yeah. he was asking me. He goes, "Hey, uh, are, are you excited?" I go, "Yeah, I'm very excited." So we were just asking. You know, he just asked me to ask you about the thong stuff. So yeah, oh, he's, no, he's no. crazy. So I love John. Oh, look, I, I've got a heap of singlets that he can. He I've got from. <laughs> Jim Beam singlets. I said, you want them? Yeah, I'll have them because he wears singlets all the time. So he, he, he'd be the type of bloke that would wear singlet and it's like two degrees, you know, like just no, 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 doesn't feel the weather. So yeah, he was telling me that he just, he just got a drone and I just got one too. So we were trading pictures of drones, you know, to each other. So hmm. yeah, uh, he's got some pretty good footage, he's, you know, cause it takes, they'd be pretty hard to fly when you first get them. I'm never, I haven't got one, but yeah, he's got some good footage of like, you know, going over things. And I was thought about getting one, but here, I'm not sure where you guys are in America. Like, do you have to get like a, um, uh, a license to be able to go into like national parks or anything to, to, to fly and film? You know, I, I think if you go, I think, I, you know, I could be wrong. That's a good question. I that, that, that is a good question. I know if we go into a national park, I think in the past, uh, I know Jeff Mildrum was a part of this uh, project that had drones, and I think uh, the the National Air deal, I forgot the name, I forgot the abbreviation for, for the U.S. here, but they, they kept changing the rule on it, and so I'm not sure. That's actually a good question. Um, so if anybody has that answer, please let us know or get on the comments on our Facebook or Instagram or Twitter message us or, message us or something. Cause I do not know. That's actually a good question. Mm-hmm. I know here that you look, you can't fly over you know, houses and stuff and in national parks, you're not supposed to, but if you get a permit or a license, you can, but you're only in certain areas as well. So I know attila has got a permit to be able to do that because as a filmmaker, you just want to, take those like B grade roles as he says and you just film that adds up to making the documentary yeah um, yeah. so you just can't go out and start flying them around the three sisters at Katoomba and stuff like that because it's all got to do with privacy and safety so yeah that's actually good mm. good to know we, we, I gotta do some research before I start yeah before I start winging that thing out yeah, so, you don't wanna you know. break, break any laws yeah I don't I don't wanna yeah, yeah, yeah. and look yeah, yeah, yeah. we were we were up in a place called the Pilliger and Pilliger's got um, a lot of stories, and it's even got the Pilliger princess, and it's supposed to be some lady that you know, tries to thumb a rides on the side of the road, but you know she's a ghost. So mm-hmm. and, uh, we had some weird things happen in the Pilliger, and um, yeah, Tilla had a, a drone up, and um, and it started like the battery power started going down. So what it does, I think it happens on all drones. I'm not sure, but it'll go to its last GPS point that you set of that. And the last GPS point was in Sydney, and we're like six hours north. So it's just <laughs> going wow. to take off into the bush, and he's fighting it, going, no, 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 because if it just took off, he went fighting it because it was going to die in five minutes or something. Yeah. So he would have went into the bush and just crashed. Oh, so he's trying God. to we had to crash land it. He had to crash land it, and, I'm, he's, and he was fighting it because it wanted to go this way, and he's going, no, you've got to go back this way. And, he, and I was just... And I'm just standing there going, oh, what's going on? Again, just trying to go back to Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. We're in the middle of nowhere, and it's just this, like, oh, it's just crazy bushland there. And it's like, yeah, it's six hours to get up there, and there's been a lot of sightings there over the years of Yowies. And we were actually at a spot, and it was like an old bee uh, keeper's area. And um, we just found it, and we're in Attila's four-wheel drive, so we turn up, and... We thought, oh, we'll just camp here for the last night and then we'll go home because we were at a camping ground, but we were leaving the camping ground, going into areas overnight and then coming back. So we got there and there was, uh, there was um, another guy, Dan and, and Attila and my wife and myself. So we just set up and had everything there and we are cooking bacon and bloody hot sausages and everything to get smell out there to, to attract, you know, we're thinking, yeah, we just got to get attracted to barbecue. Anyway, uh we started hearing these noises because I got my parabolic dish and I'm going, I hear the noises. And at the time, we thought they were like wild dogs. So we kind of like took off and Tiller and the boys said, look, we're going home. So they didn't get home till three or four o'clock the next morning. And well, my sister didn't live that far away, a few hours away. And I thought I'll go and see her, which I planned to do after that trip. And we actually went to a place that was a hotel in Narrabri. And we actually found a carving of the Yowie in the, one of, in the pub. 
So we got photos. I said, I found him. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, we, and uh, yeah, so, but it, we end up listening to it, and it just, it, Tilly goes, I don't think they're dogs. I think there's something else. That, like, it, it, that was the first time, like you were saying about the Bigfoot's mimicking something. That, right. It could have been, yeah, he's mimicking dogs. So I've got the recording. I've got to listen to it again and just, yeah. You know, do, if, and if you do, you need to share it because I'd, I'd love to hear that. All right, I'll try and um, I'll try and see it because I've got like, I've got a uh, a folder on my computer and it's just just under it says hiking, but it's got all my research from uh, like my like I'll, every time I'll go out, I will take videos and photos and I'll put them on a folder and I'll date the folder and say where it was so I can go back and say oh that's you know exact the, the exact day that I actually recorded it. So that's smart. It should, it should be there somewhere. Yeah, I've got too many it's just files. I can scroll, scroll for a minute, and the, the files just keep coming on. So, you know, I don't go out every day. I'm not able to because everyone's got a nine to five job. I've got right. Yeah, you know, I don't work nine to five, but I'm uh, earlier. I start earlier because I'm a warehouse manager of a furniture company, and um, yeah, so I, I can go out as much as I can. So it's mainly we go out. It's like go out on a Saturday and a Saturday night and then come home Sunday or sometimes we'll take a day off work and go out Friday night, Saturday night. Yeah. And then when it's doc- doing a documentary, it's you know basically, basically one night we're going out there because everyone's got no time to stay out too long. And But that's basically what it is. And and all, I can, all I've done in my, for all my research is I'll look up the places that have been known hotspots and then I'll go there and leave sound recorders for like seven days until the batteries run out. I'll come back the next week and then I'll go through it and it might take me three or four hours to go through because some of the the spikes, when you put them on a program, you know the aeroplanes, right. like aeroplanes come over from Sydney and they go over the Blue Mountains and then they turn north or keep going over to Western Australia. So you kind of know what the spikes are. And then sometimes I've got recordings and there's really very little spike there. I've just happened to come across it because you can't listen to seven days of recordings. No, it's tough. Right? That's tough. And I don't really take any notice during the day because there's too many noises from other animals, birds and everything, and the wind and everything. But nighttime, everything seems to settle down and that's where I get <laughs> uh, where I, 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 I concentrate on. So, yeah, so um, that's why I, uh, I, I've been lucky and here and there that I find things and it's and if you put yourself in the right locations, you do your research, you can generally find something that's interesting. It doesn't mean it's Yowie related, but it might yeah. make you keep going back to that area. Like I found one footprint in the Blue Mountains and it was actually on a trail called Lindemans Pass and it's a it's a goes in between uh, the National Pass, which comes from Wentworth Falls and goes to the Valley of the Waters and then you get on to Roberts Pass um, Trail, and then you get off on that and go into Lindemans Pass, and Lindemans Pass is really not, um, there's no upkeep being on it. They, they, the national park's just, you know, you've got to be an a experienced hiker to go through that to get to Katoomba or Lura. And um, I t- actually took my kids on it, and I thought, we'll just walk along this until it starts getting, you know, a bit too much for the boys. My kids were about 13 at the time, so it was like about eight years ago. And I've gone to this place that's getting a bit muddy and there's all these other footprints there, but not uh, a shoe prints. But then there's one there and it's like 42 centimetres long and it's probably about oh, three inches wide, if that, and it just looked really weird. So I got a video footage of it and photos. And what I did, I didn't have a measuring tape, but I had these like um, kind of oat bars and I had the packets and I just spread the packets out from to where the toes were to the heel and, and I just went, took a photo, and then I thought, all right, I'll measure that when I get home, and it measured to 42 centimetres. Wow. So that's, you know, so it's not like I'm finding footprints. I've found one set of footprints since researching since 2005. Um, yeah, so it's mainly tree breaks and the sound recordings that I get, um, you know, and then I've actually seen the, the Junjity. Um, in the Junjity, they have different names too. You get brown jacks. Um, and there's another couple other indigenous names that I can't pronounce, but there's a few different names. It depends on the tribes. It's like you guys, you got Sasquatch and Omar and all that kind of thing. So there's yeah. all different names. For it. So yeah, but it's you, you just got to go out there and and just keep your eyes open. You know, I've I've ha- happened to walk past things that other people have picked up because I've been concentrating on another area, and they go, "What about this?" And I'm like, "Shit, I just walked past that." So you can easily miss stuff. There's too mm-hmm. much out there to try and take in, you know, when you're in the bush. Absolutely. I have to agree with you 100%. 
Because like the bush, I was watching the videos. I was watching your videos. I was watching Attila's documentary. It's some thick yeah. over there. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's like I don't know. It's like Vine City. I mean, it's like you can't even see like ten feet or I don't know a meter past it or something. Yeah. Yeah, it's, you just can't go through them because they're called lawyer vines and they just grub older. They've got hooks on them. So. <laughs> yeah. How does um, one find your your YouTube or, or how, how does someone find you and find your material? Well, um, I used to run Facebook groups, um, and but I just got out of all that. I just concentrate on all my research on my youtube channel which is um australian yowie so and you'll just see a picture of me kind of like standing on a log it's my, my wife took it from for me standing up on a log there um looking you know i don't know what would you say just posing um <laughs> <laughs> it was actually taken up at a place called wingham which is where my sister lives um it was up on a mountainside so yeah australian yowie it's got all um everything that I've pretty much found. Um, some of the earlier videos were taken with a, a cheap camera, a cheap video recorder, but lately I've got a Sony 4K uh, video handy cam, which the reason why I bought it is because it had good battery life. Uh, it's got its own stability. Um, I don't know what they call it. In Say if you wobble the camera, you can the, the actual video recording unit inside will go against it so it keeps it level. So if you're walking stabilizer, along... Stabilizer yes, room stabilizer yeah i'm not really a cameraman like a tiller he knows all it yes. and um yeah so yeah, as you're walking along it doesn't go up and down like a yo-yo and then the um the zoom you can zoom it all the way in and it doesn't pixelate at the end it still gives you a, a clear picture so that's why i bought it and there's a heap of researchers out there that got the same um, video sony handycam so yeah it's the only place that you can find me on I'm, I'm always happy if anyone wants to ask questions on messenger you can look up yowie dan and message me questions you know i'm happy to talk um, any time that you know I'm available. So if anyone wants to have a chat to me on, on Messenger, I'm quite happy to have a chat about Yowies or Bigfoots and anything like that. So um, everyone's got their own views on like Yowies. They, some people think they've got to do a view of UFOs and some th- people think they go through portals and all this kind of stuff. It's free world. Anyone can think what they, what they believe it's true, but my belief is they're just a flesh and blood creature. That's, I'm not sure if it's out of Africa or if it's something that come from Southeast Asia and during the land bridges, it happened to come down here. And then when those land bridges actually got cut off by the sea, then they got stuck here and they've grown bigger or the small ones are just like uh, that Homo floriensis that was found up in somewhere in Sumatra or Indonesia or something like that. So it's just like a hobbit type creature. So I'm not I'm not sure where they come from. If they or they just happen to, you know, come from Australia and that's their native here. Like that's just their place they evolved. So right. I'm I'm a flesh and blood creature a believer. They just like us. They just like any other type kind of ape, um, and they just survive in the bush. And that's where they that's where they live. That's 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 my own views on that. But look, if they come from the UFOs and UFOs drop them down, until I see that. Right, right. And I, I, I'm not into that theory, but a lot of people are. A lot of people have seen UFOs when they've actually had some type of like Bigfoot or UFO or, or, or Yowie encounters. But I haven't really seen UFOs or anything uh, that have been when I've had some sort of a uh, Yowie activity. So I'm just not on that kind of. I don't believe. Not saying I don't believe. I'm not. I can't say it's 100 percent not true. But I'm just a flesh and blood believer. And that's 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 what I believe in. Um, uh, it, until I see anything other, that's all I can believe. Gotcha. Well, I, 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 I just recently did a podcast not long ago, and it, it was two hours I talked for, and I said to the guy, look, I don't know if you guys have heard, the, heard of this saying, but I could talk the bark off a tree, so that's how much <laughs> I can talk to. <laughs> you know, I, I mean this when I say this. Man, you're, you're more than welcome to come back on. We had, I had a great time talking to you. Sir. Uh, anytime, mate. Anytime. Um, I'm available. Um, yeah, let's have another chat about Yowie's. Like, one thing I'll say before I go, um, like always hiking thongs, obviously. But <laughs> the other thing I'll say is Dean Harrison, which is pretty much the most well known uh, Yowie researcher in Australia, has the Australian Yowie Research Forum uh, um, site. He said, once it's in your blood, that means once you're researching Yowie's, it's in your blood, it's never going to go. Even if you stop 
research, researching and going out, you're still going to get on Facebook or something and look up what other people are doing. It's it's always going to be there. It's a bug, you know. Like, and it's true because I've had this uh, not obsession, but I've been researching them since 2005, and I'll say I've met some like wonderful people. I've made more friends as an adult doing Yari research than then ever being a kid. Usually, you make your friends when you're growing up at school. And they, they stay lifelong friends. I've got more friends that I've met during Yari research. And that's one thing that if even if I don't find anything, I have uh, a great time being out enjoying the Australian bush and enjoying with um, great people that I've met along the way. So that's what, you know, it's in my blood now and it's never going to leave. Absolutely. I love that. That's a good saying, yeah. Um, All righty. Well, I... Yeah, no worries. Thanks a lot for that. It's been great chatting to you guys. Yeah, and like any time you want to have a chat, just send me a message and... We'll book a time and we'll, you know, talk about, like I said, my favourite subject, the Yowie. Alrighty. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Thank, Thank you. you, guys. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.